Today's speakers are Jeff James, the leader of Fraser and Dieter's National Benefit Plan Consulting Group, and Ken Kirk, Chairman and CEO of Vinings Management Corporation. Jeff and Ken are joined by Lee Dobbs of Ronstadt USA. And now, to get started, I will hand you over to Jeff James. Thank you, Adele. Uh, thanks for your time this afternoon, attendees. For are, you defer, are your deferred compensation arrangements at risk? And hopefully they're not at risk, but uh, it's a tough area. And as you see on the first screen here, when scoring a 99 out of 100, you fail. Uh, an A minus, B plus doesn't, doesn't work. If there are any issues with regards to the plan, there's no materiality here. You have an issue and the IRS will jump it all over it. So uh, it's an important area, high risk area. And hopefully today we'll cover what you need to know. And if not, uh, you know, send in your questions and we'll answer those. In today's topics, uh, I'm going to do a quick 409A overview. And then Ken's going to jump in and go over some violations and penalties. Uh, we'll update on IRS audit activity and Lee Dobbs. Ron Stott's going to talk a little bit from the corporate HR perspective on 409A and non-qualified deferred comp plans. Then uh, Ken will jump back in real quick for preparing for a 409A audit. And we'll leave at least 10 minutes at the end for questions and answers. So if I send questions in and we don't answer them during the uh, talk during the, the talk, uh, we'll try to get to them at the end. So real quickly, uh, do a quick 409A overview. And again, this isn't intended to be a de detailed dive into 409A because that would take a, a full day. So it's just going to be hitting the, the key topics under 409A as to what's required. And uh, and then again, Ken will go into some compliance side of it. So what is 409A? Uh, hopefully most of you guys know what 409A is, but it's basically a reaction uh, to the Enron meltdown. And uh, back in those days, basically, before 409A was in place, uh, non-qualified deferred comp was very flexible. The election timing was flexible. When you took the money out, it was flexible. Uh, you know, there were many ways to get around things. Of course, that's what happened with Enron. Enron had a meltdown. And of course, before that meltdown, the executives were able to accelerate and take more than $50 million from their non-qualified deferred comp plans, while the rank and file employees got the uh, bad end of it and had to leave their money, and leave their 401k company stock in the 401k plan and lost everything. So the IRS took a look at that and said, wait a minute, we've got to put some regulations in here. That's not fair. Uh, you know, there's going to be something done to, to stop this. So they instituted for Section 409A of the code, which covers basically non-qualified deferred comp, uh, and it's not just non-qualified deferred comp plan service, but you know, option plans, anything that is deferring comp and not under the 401k or the 401a regulations is going to fall under 409a. Uh, the IRS again consider executive's ability to manipulate timing is abusive. That's with Enron, so they want to do something about it. And any uh, anything put out by the government, especially the IRS, they want revenue generation. They figured this was a good revenue opportunity. So. Uh, in basic, and again, this is basics, not detailed, 409A is intended to, number one, require employees to timely elect the deferral of compensation before 409A. That was all over the board as to when you could elect deferral, when you could elect deferral of bonuses, et cetera. So they put some, some hard rules on that. Uh, the next item they had to cover was, hey, when can you take the money out and be taxed on it? As you can see with Enron, there wasn't anything in place back then before 409A. That's how Enron was able to accelerate the uh, distributions from their non-qualified deferred comp plan, not pay any penalties, and just, you know, of course, accelerate the tax as well. But they got out with it. So it now requires employees to state exactly when future compensation will be paid. Uh, in other words, when they're going to get the payout. And the biggest thing, it eliminates any acceleration of deferred comp. So you cannot set up a deferred comp plan, say you're going to you know, take the money out 10 years down the road, and all of a sudden, say, hey, for five years, hey, I want it, hey, the company's having problems, I want this money out before the company goes under and take it. I mean, there's some exceptions, but that's basically what that is. 
real quickly on the deferral election. So the first item is, you know, when can you defer? When do you have to make an election to defer? Uh, four general areas. Uh, it's for general, generally with participants, the deferral election must be made by the end of the participant's taxable year, immediately preceding the taxable year in which services are performed. So if an individual is going to defer his 2017 compensation, he's got to have a deferral election in place in writing by December 31st, 2016. You know, prior to 498, you know, that was that was questionable and, and I know it was all over the board. Uh, for the first year, a participant becomes eligible. The deferral election must be made within 30 days after the after the date the participant becomes eligible, provided the election only applies to compensation earned following the date of the election. So if an individual is hired March 31st, he's got 30 days to get the election in place, but he can't defer previously earned income. So he can get his deferral in by April 30th, and it's going to defer income that's going to turn beyond April 30th. The key is, again, under 498, you cannot defer income that's already been earned. Uh, where the service provider does not have a right to elect that the election must be made, then the election must be made no later than the time the service provider has legally binding rights to compensation. So if it's if it's an election that's made at the employer level, the service provider and the service provider, which is the participant, doesn't have any right to change that election, then again the deferral cannot be made, you know, before the or after the legally binding right to compensation. And finally, we're not going to go over performance-based compensation. And this is a touchy area, and it's an area that, you know, is your bonus performance-based? Is it not performance-based? There are a lot of facts and circumstances that have to be met. But if it's looked at as performance-based compensation, in general, uh, the compensation determined over the compensation determined over a 12-month period, the election must be made no later than six months before the end of the performance period. So if you've got a performance-based compensation, that's set for 2017 uh, that the individual will re receive after that 12 month period, maybe in 2018, you've got to have to have that election in place by June 30th, 2017. But again, that's sort of that's an area that really you could you could talk for an hour and a half on as to what is performance based, what is not. So next thing is so the election is covered. The next thing that's important is if the individual has to then specify when that payment's going to make made or really when they're going to have access to this deferred compensation. Deferred compensation payments must only be paid upon permissible compliant payment triggers. That trigger then is specified in the in the deferral election uh, written document. It's got to be a specified date set at a time set at the time of deferral. It's, it's, you know, again it can't be set later. It's got to be set when that deferral is made. And it can be at, upon death, upon disability, uh, you can take money out on an unforeseeable emergency. If there's changing control, then that you can take that money out. That's, that you know is before what the the date is specified. A separate separation from service again. You need to look at the plan document, but of course that comes before the date is specified. Some money's going to come out. All those items, you know, allow you to take that money out before uh, the date specified. And then for key employees, and again. You know, this is this is a an offshoot from Enron in those days. Distributions on separation from service have to be delayed six months. So if the key employee you know quits on June 30th, he can't get that distribution until December 31st. Hey, and Jeff, we're going to go back to those two yeah. concepts because this, you know, I'm, we're going to talk about that all, quite a bit today because that's what the service is looking for are the triggers, which are those those events, those times, and then a very a specific, uh, you know, a, a, a date, and then the form. So it's right. triggers and form, triggers and form, and we'll we'll go back to that several times today. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I think finally, uh, it, you know, again, compensation is deferred into another calendar year. You have the written arrangement; it must state the time or trigger and form of payment. So, for if the participant has discretion in the amount, time, or for form of benefit, the election must be made by certain deadlines. Uh, for example. With the example here, employee has an option to defer year two salary. The election must be made by 1231 of year one, and must he must select both the year and form of distribution. So this is, all has to be in writing at the time of deferral. The trigger has to be there, and you know Ken's going to go 
into more detail later on that. Uh, again, acceleration, once the trigger and form are elected, the compensation generally cannot be accelerated. There are a couple of exceptions. I'm sure Penn will talk about that. There is an exception for cash out of small amounts less than the 402G or the amount you can actually defer into a 401k plan. Uh, quadros, of course, can cause a, uh, an acceleration in tax, uh, if, you know, if it's needed for tax uh, provisions, et cetera, or not for, for tax assessments then that can also cause an acceleration that's allowed, but just very few uh, exceptions. Uh, and a plan can include, as we've talked about before, special payouts for change in control. And the key is you got to look to your plan document for language and hope that the uh, language is proper in the plan document, and that needs to be followed. And then finally... Could, if I could just mention on that, on that, Jeff, sure. and it, it, it's not kind of a you know, a, a form document uh, that, that you need to use those change of control provisions. Different companies are going to have different thresholds and needs. You know, we've got w one company that's, that's owned by, by a private equity uh, uh, company, and they know they're going to be bought and sold probably several times. And what they don't want to happen, and what, what did happen to their CEO one time, was it was forced out because of the way the plan document. We've got another client that, that if they get taken over, it's not going to be a pretty situation and they're not going to want to leave the monies in the in the plan. So you need to kind of look at your your change of control provisions to make sure they kind of fit your your circumstance. Yeah, you need to look at that language. And then, and then finally, so if you can't accelerate, you also really can't delay. They had used to be what was called a rolling risk of forfeiture. It's still out there, but you really can't delay the payments either. You know, unless you meet certain requirements, you can delay them. If you know if compensation deduction limits are met, or their security laws are violated, et cetera, or if there's a going concern issue, those are items that allow you to delay it. Other than that, the only way you can delay it is you've got to make a new election 12 months before the scheduled payment date, and then that election has to go out at least five years from the payment date. That's the only way you can delay it. In the old days, I remember with rolling risk of forfeiture fees, people used to come up and say, okay. Yeah, so it's supposed to get paid out next month. I'll change my election to get paid out next year, change my next election to get paid out next year, and they roll it every year. Well, that's not allowed anymore. So, so that's really basically the basics of 49A. And again, in 10 minutes, which uh, you probably could go over four hours, uh, you know, that's it. As you can see from the next slide, uh, you know, 49A basically can reach into every, everything. I mean, it's, it's not just deferred comp arrangements, uh, supplement employer retirement plans, can hit bonus plans. Uh, 457F covers 49A now, and there's been some recent regulations on the 457F that have made 49A more re outreaching to that. Stock options, uh, stock appreciation rights, if they're not set up correctly, 49A can be there in set of awards. So you've got to be careful with the, you know, pretty much what you have with regards to 49A. And if it looks like there's a, there's a deferral of income, and uh, you got to make sure you're under 49A and meet those requirements. Otherwise, uh, you look at penalties and additional tax. So that's it for the overview. I'm going to turn this over to Ken, and he's going to take you into violations and into the, the fun stuff with regards to 49A. Yeah, the fun stuff. The bad, the bad guy comes up and just pipe in at anything that you that you want. So, um, so, so, what have we seen as far as violations, and how can that occur? There's really two main ways that that you can violate 409A. First, of course, is with the plan documents. Uh, you know, most of the, the you know companies on the phone have probably worked with your, you know, your law firm, and probably, you know, all of your core plans are, you know, probably squared away and in, in good shape. Uh, but you know, it's, we'll talk about some ways where maybe you know maybe they're not, or maybe you've made some acquisitions and you acquired some some plans. So the first thing is the plan documents to make sure not just the as Jeff said, not just the non-qualified plan, but uh, the severance agreements, uh, employment agreements, all of those things were on that kind of spider page before uh, you have all of those documents squared away. The second, and, and is where we're seeing a lot of the violations uh, come up, is, is through operational uh, mistakes. Uh, basically procedures either through company staff who, you know, isn't fo following the plan document or the administrators of the plan who just who make a mistake, who interpret the document wrong, and whose pr the process is kind of institutionally set uh, to, 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 to not be, uh, you know, to be compliant. 
So violations can even occur on an operational standpoint, even if what staff does or your administrator makes mistakes that are not uh, in, in compliance with the plan document. That's, you know, that doesn't matter. The fact that there are mistakes, those still are, are violations under 409A. So why this is, you know, a big concern to, to a, lot of, a lot of companies, a lot of HR staff, CFOs, et cetera, is that unlike, you know, generally qualified plans, the taxation and the penalties under 409A are imposed upon the participants, which is, you know, really kind of odd and unusual. And in, in my, my humble opinion, 409A really puts the, the penalty on the wrong party. Um, it, sh it you know, really should be on the company for the, 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 you know, the documents, for the operation of the plan, because most of the participants under these plans, they don't have any control of when payments are made, when deferrals are posted to their account. Um, a lot of times they don't even understand the plans that they're in, much less control them. But from what Jeff said, if you go back to the Enron days, the, 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 the you know, kind of the bad guys and every, what everybody was looking at were the executives that left. So that's why I think it was written that way was because they were really pointing um, at those, those people that took the $50 million out. But that's water under the bridge. That's, that's the way it is. So, you know, it's kind of back to that very first slide, like you, you make the 99 out of 100 and all of a sudden your CEO gets a, you know, gets, gets a, a tax and gets penalized, that's not something that's, you know, good for anybody, Jeff. Yeah, is it a true pen, though, that uh, if you think about it, what happens eventually is the corporation ends up getting hit with it because they're going to make up that 20% and gross up on taxes for these, these executives. I mean, a lot of times because it's not the executive's fault, it's the you know, it's the company's fault, it's just not operating the plan properly. Is that that, 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 that's probably going to be the case, but, you know, if, if the guy who leaves, they didn't like him anyway, it's like, well, it's, <laughs> yeah, that's his problem. Now, there are some indemnification clauses, and we'll talk about that, that can be in the contract. And, and, and you know, you as, a, as employers can think through whether or not you want to indemnify your participants or not. So we'll talk about that. But you're, you're right. I think a lot of times it will go back to the company. But as, you know, participants, it's, you know, they're the ones who get the check. So they're going to have to go back to the employers to get, um, you know, to get reimbursed. Um, so basically what happens, if 409A is violated, um, all, you know, all of the benefits, all the accounts um, for that participant and or possibly the plan, if it's, if it's a broad-based violation, they become immediately taxable. Uh, plus, there's a 20% penalty tax that's that's imposed upon whatever amount has become taxable um, this this th there are situations where the ent the entire benefit could become taxable however the company is prohibited or is held to a contract that only allows them to pay that over a, a sort of periodic payment and so what you have is basically a tax on phantom income so jeff you're right you're, yeah. you you hope the company steps up and takes care of that for instance, if it's a if it's a, a SERP, which is usually what the, you call a DB, you know, non-qualified. If it's a SERP, it's a DB plan, and they they violated uh, 409. The whole ta the whole accrued benefit, the present value of that becomes taxable, but they can't pay it out for 10 years or over a lifetime. So you've got this big lump sum, if you will, that's taxed, but there's no money there. So that you know that's a that could be a pretty serious issue. Um, another thing that that you know, it's really important to, to consider is that that in 409A, there's there's some some very broad of abilities given the service to aggregate different plans within the same employer. So, for instance, if you've got if if you've got a core plan, a core um, non-qualified plan, a core SERP, a core core 457F uh, for you know most of your employees, but but you acquire a company who's got a smaller plan, but it's virtually the same type of plan, except it's not compliant. So what the service can do, if they find non-compliance in that smaller plan, then all of a sudden they, they aggregate the plans and, and your big plan then becomes has problems because it's, it's viewed as, as, as one plan. So we'll talk a little bit more about the whole takeover situation, but that's that's a real serious issue for some of our clients is making sure that, that as they acquire plans, acquire companies, 
and not just plans, but severance agreements too, Jeff. Now, now, do you see that with uh, with acquisitions in the due diligence phase? Are they looking close enough at the uh, deferred comp? I mean, they, they look to see that if there's deferred comp has to be paid out, but are they really looking at the deferred comp arrangements or anything else there? I, mean, I think they, this is an area that's just like qualified plans aren't looked at close that, enough. Exactly. Yeah, they'll, they'll, look, they'll look at the... The, the liability, sometimes they'll look at the funding and the whole, you know, the credibility of earnings, you know, due diligence. Sometimes they don't even look at it. But certainly that the documentation, the process the process, we've never seen during 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 the due diligence phase, we've never really had a, a company dig into the process of what was going on during that time. Yeah, because the, the key is is if you do a proper due diligence, at least you can put some escrow, you know, in the purchase. It says that hey, if there is something wrong, we see there might be something wrong with this plan. Here's money escrowed out to take care of that. Otherwise, you're you know the buyer's stuck once he's got it. All right, because they can have some big liabilities for these these penalties and taxation to their participants. So you're right. Yeah, that's just something that should be considered. Okay, so so the next few pages, you know, I, I first had this kind of fancy title of you know possible violations under non qualified uh, they're war stories <laughs> so these are things we hear from 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 clients from consulting firms from you know from from Jeff and his folks these are some of the things that we see out there that are causing violations of 409a i mean you know the kind of the simplest most visible one are distribution errors that somebody's supposed to get a payment under a a non qualified plan under a severance plan under an employment agreement um, and somebody decides to pay it early. Uh, you know, we saw this as a vice chairman of one of our companies. He was supposed to get a, uh, some severance benefits. Uh, he wanted them in the current taxable year rather than next year's. So he went to Treasury and they went ahead and paid his check out a few months early, like oops. Or just the opposite. There are distributions that are supposed to be made that maybe the record keeper is supposed to make them in a calendar year or you know one month and they don't get paid out for six months later those are you know clear violations of uh, you know 409a um, the second thing is, is is that we that that someone has elected to defer monies you know on a monthly basis and for what whatever reason you know payroll record keeper uh, those are either not not uh, taken out of their paycheck or they're not remitted to the uh, to the record keeper, uh, and those are you know those are just errors. But if those become systematic, uh, it can cause real 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 problems. Uh, also, uh, the wrong amounts we see that sometimes. Actually, more often than not, we'll see the wrong amounts being being withheld. Uh, and if generally, if you get that cleaned up by the end of the calendar year, you're okay. Uh, but sometimes they don't they don't see that. Um, so, some plans have evergreen provisions in them. And to, to me, and that's okay if somebody's looking at that, but that can be a real red flag that you basically have the same deferral amount going in there and somebody's not checking that year in and year out to make sure that those are, those are correct. That's right. um, it, it, was, it was a best practice or, or a prevalent practice uh, that, that companies linked the participation in the, in the, in the deferred comp plan to the 401k plan and some of the um, some of the um, uh, you know top heavy rules et cetera in the 401k plan, there are some very uh, stringent um, um, rules now of what can and can be done on that. And there are, and and a lot of the plans that used to be fine now that linkage between the 401k plan eligibility and the deferred comp is a real serious problem. Yeah, that's an area I've seen, Ken, and I think. You know, if, if you do have that linkage, you need to look at your plan document and make sure that, that the deferral language is proper and that the deferral is being made at the proper time and not being made, you know, early before. If you know if there's any excess, in other words, you excess benefit plans, excess 401k money going in, it's just something I think that's missed a lot. And, again, it can get complicated, but this is another area you really look, need to look at your uh, non-qualified deferred comp plan document to see how it handles it. Yeah. Another thing is just as simple as, as hardship distributions. A lot of times there's, I mean, there is a there is a 409A compliant method to set up hardship distributions. And a lot of times we've not seen that in documents. Uh, they're too, again, it goes back to, to triggers and form. Exactly when do, when do hardship provisions, can they be paid out? In what form? How are they going to be paid out? 
And a lot of times that isn't stipulated very well in the document. Uh, we, we've seen, you know, basically the, the investment committee or the benefits committee of the, you know, at the company basically have the discretion uh, on hardship provisions, and that's a real no-no. Um, so, you know, those little things can, can come back and, and, you know, really be problems. Same thing, same thing on, on disability. Um, not having compliant uh, definitions of, of disability, which are different than a qualified plan, uh, and, and they're, they're too get vague, there's discretion, it's not stipulated when they start, where they, you know, how long they go, et cetera. We've seen that. Um, there was a, a court case on FICO withholding, the Davidson versus Hinkle case, uh, where basically the, 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 company, the company was, fine li liable, was found liable for not doing proper uh, FICA uh, withholding uh, and payment on deferred comp amounts. And, and that is, that's a really serious thing with the services, that, that when they don't get their money up front at the right time. And 409A was all about the proper timing of, of taxation. Jeff, you want to say something? Yeah, Ken, real quick on this one. Do you know that, so again, the, the ruling is, is, is when something's deferred or earned, you have to take FICA withholding out on it. You know, not regular tax, it's not subject to income tax, et cetera, but the FICA has to come out. If that's not done, when the individual gets the money down the road, not only are the deferral amounts, but all of the earnings are also taxable for FICA. Uh, in this case, if they hit the employer with that FICA liability up front, did they also then hit the participant down the road with the FICA liability on the earnings? Oh. Both sides. Yeah, yeah, and there were, I think, as I remember, it was about a $50 million settlement on this. Yeah, because that could be a big number, guys, if this is missed. Uh, you know, if the market's going well and the investments are done well, you know, the individual, if it's not done right here, is paying FICA on all those items that are earnings, not just deferrals down the road. So, sorry, Ken. No, 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 that's good. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, we could go on, on on that, but that's, a, that's, that's, that's an issue to take a look at. Um, so let me, you know, through some of our basically audits or, or our audit diagnostics, um, here are just kind of a list of the things, some of the things that we've seen. Just missing election forms, uh, omitted distributions uh, that were supposed to happen, didn't happen, were, were bunched up, went into the wrong calendar year. Um, a lot of times, companies, particularly if there's acquisitions, they can't find their documents. They, they don't know where the plan document is. They don't know where communications documents are. And as, as the service comes in, they're not really forgiving, like, well, we can't find it. Um, so that, that's, that's been an issue. We've seen mismatches between what, what hits the W-2 uh, and what is actually deferred in the plan and what actually is distributed under the plan. So you've got to make sure somebody's syncing all that up. Um, employment agreements are, are a real issue um, because a lot of times in, in the employment agreements, they're, they're promising benefits. When somebody leaves, it's like a severance benefit. They, that we, we've seen uh, that, that under termination, under certain, certain circumstances, they enhance uh, the payments under under the under the plan, they have the ability to sell or accelerate. So, for those of you with employment agreements, uh, to really make to make sure that that thing is synced up with your with your non qualified plan. Yeah, and Ken, that's a great point on the enhanced amounts that you see in options. If you, you know, under stock option agreements, as long as when you grant that option, that the the grant the prices with the fair value data grant. Uh, and there's no discount, it's fine, but if you add an enhancement that, that has a discount down the road, then that blows that, uh, that protection right there, and you're under 409A. It's the same way with the deferred comp. If you say your deferred comp is going to be this, and then you enhance it down the road, now you're deferring more than is actually in the agreement, and, you know, you bust it 409A. So. Yep, exactly. Um, if, if, if any of you guys have either had or still have split dollar arrangements, those are now um, governed under 409A, and a lot of times the, the old plans, which those, th those things were such a mess anyway, but uh, a lot of times there's what's called a rollout, where, where the company basically rolls out the ownership of those split dollar programs, and th that's, that can be a real mess. A lot of times that's accelerated, and there's some big dollars involved in those. So, so if you have a split dollar program, just, just you know, make sure that, that, that those are, are 409, uh, 409A compliant. Um, 
also, which, which is interesting, a lot of companies have, have funded their non-qualified plans, severance plans, too, in, in rabbi trusts to protect against you know, a number of contingencies, but one of which is a change of control. And, and a lot of times, just some, you know, it's a, it's a trust company, it's, it's your 401 record keeper, it's somebody who goes and pulls the form off the, you know, off the hard drive somewhere and puts it in without a lot of, a lot of coordination or thought, and it's kind of like a form document. But if, if there's a, a provision in there on change of control that conflicts with your plan document, that's, that's a 409A uh, violation. Um, so, so we have a lot of companies that just have, you know, have got a rabbi trust out there and maybe they've got, you know, two million, five million, fifty, hundred million dollars in it and they've never reviewed the provisions of that rabbi trust, number one, for, for, for 409A compliance, but number two, to how to make sure that, that really that trust is set for the circumstances of the company. So anybody that has a, four, has a rabbi trust, I, you know, I'd urge you to kind of dust that thing off see if it's current best practice, see if it's compliant. Um, okay, more war stories. Um, uh, severance plans, those things can really be a complicated issue, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but th these, are, these are issues that we've seen in severance plans that, that are in violation of 409A, back to trigger and form a payment. And, and basically, you know, you know, post-termination health coverage, unused sick leave, um, expats provisions to get, you know, basically when, when you, you know, they're shipped out of the country, what you pay them to come back, all of that needs to be 409A compliant. That's, and that's a great point on the international side is uh, that a lot of people are under the, uh, the belief that 409A only covers payments in the U.S. If you have U.S. individuals, overseas, internationally receiving U.S. In source income, you know, it's still subject to 409A, and that's missed a lot. So, yeah. you, know, you need to take a look at that. I mean, if you've got an international company, you know, just be careful. Yeah. Um, next one. Uh, particularly in the not-for-profit world, there were, were um, these, these, uh, these perk plans, sometimes called flex plans, that basically you're, you know, the executives were given an allocation of, you know, so many dollars a year and they could apply those to life insurance, disability, other benefits. And then the remaining portion goes into some type of deferral or some type of 457F plan. And, and if, if any of you have those, that could be a, a basically that that amount is not, um, is, you know, it's whatever's left over is, is what went into the plan that could be a violation of 409A because it wasn't a specified amount and, and the distribution of those uh, wasn't also uh, allocated. So if, if any of you have any of those flex plans, you ought to take a look at that. Um, we've seen companies that, that basically give you know, advances, bonus, bonuses in lieu of, of contributions to the plan or matchings to the plan. Um, that's something that we've seen. Let's see, what else? Um, 457F plans, as Jeff said, are, are, are subject to 409A, and that what, what Jeff said, we've seen that quite a few times, that to, to qualify for that substantial risk of forfeiture for 457F, it had those rolling forfeiture periods. You can't do that under, under, under 409A anymore. It's just what Jeff said, you've got to do it 12 months befo before um, uh, the payments are going to be made, and you've got to push them out for five years. You just can't push them out for another 12 months. So if you've got any of those, take a look. I, I'm, I'm not going to go through and, and specifics on this. Um, oh, the little graphic up in the top right popped up. And my point there was that these are, this is kind of that spider. The, those are these tentacles that 409A has that touches a lot of other things non-compete agreements, separation of, separ of, of, of service, there's complexity there. Um, another thing that's missed is, is if, if you're underfunded on a pension plan, you can't, you can't make contributions into the rabbi trust, and a lot of companies are still doing that. That's a 409A issue. So there's, it's, it's again, that, that, that kind of spider up in the top right, all those, those little tentacles that go out. Okay, so what's happening now with the, with the service? Um, in 2014, the IRS conducted 
what, what, what I consider a test market. I mean, I came from the old retail environment with Procter & Gamble, uh, and we did a lot of test markets to see where we could get revenue. Well, that's exactly what the service does. And the way they do a test market is through this thing called a Compliance Initiative Project, a CIP. So they conducted a CIP in 2014 as, as, as their test market. At that time, they went out and, and took 10 very large uh, companies, uh, excuse me, 50 very large companies, and audited the, the accounts of, of their 10 most highly compensated people. And through that, that process, they found a lot of noncompliance. And, and then, you know, transitive property, right, A equals B, well, to them that meant a lot of revenue opportunity. Uh, so in 2016, the IRS took that uh, CIP and expanded the scope of that for 409A um, and they uh, proposed further uh, regulatory uh, clarifications in 2006 uh, for 409A. So this expanded audit um, uh, project now it includes all significantly more plan sponsors. It's gone into the to the not-for-profit world. And, and we've, got some, we've got some clients, you know, we've got one client that has about 1,000 employees and they've got 35, 40 people in the, in the deferred comp plan and they were audited. So the IRS is getting very aggressive on, on taking that down, uh, down market. Uh, also, this is to your, your point, this last one, is, is the IRS is looking, you know, very carefully, it's kind of a gross term, but they, that's what it's called in the market, this cavity searches on these, on these uh, uh, corporate transactions and M&A because they, they know there's revenue there because companies just aren't doing their due diligence. Real quickly, so, and, and if you think that the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the powers changed in the government, of course, are supposed to be pulling back on regulations and pulling back on IRS power and everything else, well, that may be, but it hasn't happened yet. And I'll tell you, on the uh, qualified plan side, we've seen a lot of IRS audits come up. And I mean, my belief, and this is just subjective, my opinion, is that the IRS is doing everything they can right now before their hands are tied, uh, because their hands haven't been tied yet. So not just the qualified, I'm, I imagine you're going to see a push and a spike in this for a while, you know, until they're pulled back and funding's pulled back from them. So. Okay, so that that so with that backdrop of what the IRS is is doing, um, you know, and and you know, kind of the complications. So so from a co corporate HR standpoint, what what are what are clients concerned about? What are corporations concerned about? And unfortunately. Um, our, our friend Lee Dobbs had a had a family issue come up, and she's gonna she couldn't join us, and she felt you know bad about that. So I, I'm gonna try and change my voice briefly <laughs> a little bit, and I'm just gonna kind of basically kind of go over what her concerns were, and she asked me to just kind of present that. So you know I'm a kind of a boring guy, and I know my you're sick of hearing me, but you're stuck with it. So sorry. So some of her concerns, what, you know, number one was the, was that CIP. You know, they'd heard about that. They were really concerned about it. Um, one of the things that the the the, the IRS and, and N409A it suggests is that that employers conduct a, a self audit of their plans, their agreements, of their processes, and very few companies have have done that. And so that you know, just on a due diligence basis, she, that was one of the things she was very interested in. Um, the the court case we talked about that uh, on the on the gross ups, um, you know that was a concern. Um, the the kind of the, the two areas was was the agreements we have in place, both on 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 plans and on individuals, are are those um, uh, in compliance from acquisitions, uh, and you know are, are the core plans. And then, what could be the liability that 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 they might have, um, the both risk to the to the employer and to the company, and what's the what's the kind of the magnitude of those risks? Um, so, uh, one of the th one of the, th the things that she wanted to do was to to quantify the documents and per and, and procedures, get that all in place in an administrative manual. Uh, so everything was put together under under 409A. Number one, that it was all compiled. Everything was identified. All the plans that could be aggregated uh, were were you know basically documented in that way. 
And then these, these were the five areas that, that, that her team wanted to make sure that they didn't have any exposure on. FICA withholding, uh, plan aggregation, and, imp, imp, and plans that were really impermissibly linked, and people going back and forth uh, between the plans under, you know, kind of a, con a concept of replacement plans. It's, I mean, that's a whole nother <laughs> afternoon. Uh, that was a concern. Uh, severance agreements, uh, you know, basically er errors both on the deferral and distribution side to, to basically go through transactions, make sure that all the W-2s and all are linked up and synced up. Um, and also to, to look at uh, welfare benefits, unused sick time, et cetera, and make sure that any payments on those were, were compliant and, and appropriate. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the last things that, that you know, Lee wanted to do was look at what risk management techniques were available in the marketplace for these, these items below and, and whether or not they should consider them which is basically a requirements document for all arrangements. And that's something that, you know, you know all companies should have, I, I, in my humble opinion, is, is an administrative document, a requirements document on all of their, under their compensation arrangements that could fall under 409A. Um, as I mentioned earlier, tax warranties, uh, you can put tax warranties in the, in the plan. And is that a good idea? You know, do, do you want to protect the, the participants? Do you want to protect the company? And how far do you go on that? And what are, what are the, it goes to the page before, what are the li possible liabilities and, and doing something like that? And then looking at, at all their definitions. And this goes back to trigger and form to make sure all of the components of their plans have the, that, that, that the triggers and the form very well documented. Yeah, and it's, that's important because, you know, some of these documents that have been around for a while, I think you need to look at this, you know, on at least an annual basis, if not more, because things change, and you may have language in that plan document that needs to be changed and has to be changed, uh, and so it's, it's important. You can't just feel like, hey, we put a plan document in place, we had our ERISA council look at it, it was fine six years ago, you know, how does it look now? So it's definitely something has to be looked at. Uh, often when there's uh, acquisitions, there's, there's either freezes or terminations on the plans, um, that was one of the things that they wanted to look at is to make sure that that was done in a compliant way that it didn't uh, accelerate any benefits. And then of course, uh, stock options, uh, stock-based programs fall under 409A and that's again a whole other topic uh, that's, that's really complicated. Um, yeah, then again, it's great Ken, this is important because there are, there are a lot of people out there that have stock option plans set up, restricted stock, stock appreciation rights that if not set up properly fall under 49A, they may think that they're set up properly and not under 49A, and it could be a it could be a big surprise to them when they go back and look at it because there's specific items you have to meet in order to not be subject to 49A and not have a you know deferred comp type issue with this. Right. Okay. Um, all right. So 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 what do you do? Whoops, let me click here. There we go. So, as as an as an you know as a as a plan sponsor, what what do you do? How do you prepare? And you know, it's it's kind of like any any other program. You just kind of have to take the right step and and get everything squared away and and quantified. So, a lot of our our clients, I think Jeff's, our clients. A lot of companies we know are are doing what the service recommended, which is doing their own uh, self audit of these programs to make sure that everything's squared away um, because the consequences as we've seen you know can be can be pretty bad so you know I've just got two pages here which is basically the information that you would need to c collect kind of a, a sample of it and then kind of the, the process the kind of the areas that that you might want to look at um, you've got two pages of information here if somebody wants to see a more detailed plan on doing a a self audit, or what it might be, if you had, you know, some third party um, come in and do that, we can we can do that offline with you. So here's kind of the example of the things you would want. You, you know, you have to identify the plans and the participants for for anything that you, that you believe might be touched by by 409A. Collect the documents, the employment agreements, any of the documentation, because you're going to need that. Benefit statements, W-2s, election forms. Uh, it's it's really important to go back to when the when the plan was was put in to get the intent. So if you've got 
uh, comp committee or board minutes regarding the, the, the plans. Uh, we, that's really something important to put in the documentation. Um, it's real important to, to look at your service provider. Look at what their responsibilities are under the plan, what your contracts are with them, and then look very closely at their procedures, their admin manuals, how all of these programs are being administered. I mean, like severance plans, you're not going to have a record keeper. Those are basically being done internally. So is there a process which, which needs to be documented? Uh, if not, you know, that's, that's something that needs to you know, go on your list. But look real carefully at, at how these plans are going to be um, uh, uh, administered. Um, look at the reports from the record keeper and, and payroll to make sure that they, they align with what's, what happens through payroll to what's going on in the plan, because that's where a lot of the mismatches happen. Um, uh, trust documents. Again, I think it's really important that if you have a rabbi trust, go look at your t trust documents to make sure it's synced up with your plan, because that could cause some real, real problems. If, if distributions are being made by your trustee, those, their systems are, not, are usually not designed to be 409A compliant. So if any distributions actually come out of the, 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 the rabbi trust, please take a real careful look at those. This looks like a lot, Ken, but this is what the IRS is going to be looking for if they come in, and you'd rather make sure you have everything and everything looks good as opposed to the IRS coming in and you searching and not finding things at that point. But it looks like a lot, but that's what's required. And then here's kind of typical steps. This is, again, this isn't all inclusive. This was, you know, kind of meant to be a highlight. Um, you know, you're going to look at each plan to make sure that the the, the, the deferrals and, and the deferral election rules are, are synced up with the plan and synced up with, with uh, 409A compliance. Um, make sure that each plan and then in the distribution events, actually what happens when, when checks are cut and monies come out are, are in very close um, uh, um, synchronization with your, with your plan and 409A. That's where we see a lot of the problems come out. Um, look, uh, analyze aggregation, and, and, and that's particularly with companies that have done some acquisitions because that's what the service is, is very possibly going to do is aggregate your core plan with some that you've, you've acquired, and so you need to at least know what that liability and, and you know, what that other plan is going to do. Um, look, at, look at all the operational requirements that should be done. Make sure that, that those are being, being handled properly under your plan. Um, there's kind of an audit process that you know, we go through when we're helping clients to, to look at elections, the election rules, and then what actually flows through into the plan and eventually out in distribution. Again, that that's all that's all lined up, uh, both on the on the election side, the deferral side, and the distribution side. Um, and then, you know, if, if if you find any basically any any violations, you know, you've got to get with counsel and decide what the, you know, and their and your and your, your CPA decide what the heck to do to, to do then. <laughs> yeah, I, think I think it's important, Ken. Uh, this is such a high risk area that that this preparation and review probably should be done with your ERISA counsel or with some expertise out there. It's very hard for, you know, just the HR group, uh, they're busy uh, to do this to benefits people. You need somebody really with uh, expertise in the 409A and not qualified area as your, your ERISA counsel has or maybe some other, you know, independent third-party expert. So. Yeah, and, and you know, <laughs> I, I have to, I kind of have to be you know who I am I guess so so part of this is an infor informational but but I'm going to do the just the short the short little commercial is you know both you know uh, Fraser and Dieter and, and Vinings we work real closely together to help companies you know put all this stuff together and and audit and and not that we have to do it but I, I you know it, we can at least be a resource to you if this is something what you want that you want to do on a self audit basis. You know, we've got a lot of process and procedures, or we can, you know, step in and, and do various components of that. So, uh, I know I'll, I'll say the commercial for Fraser Dieter. I knew they, I know they do a great job. So, so uh, you know, ca, ca, you know, uh, so, so call Jeff. They, they they do a great job. Anybody that wants this, just drop us a note, and and we'll give you. We're happy to provide the slides to you. We also have some really good summaries um, of of 409A and, and, you know, what the IRS is doing. So, 
So afterwards, just you know, drop us a note, and we're happy to supply uh, that to to any yeah, of you. And if questions come up afterwards, which they always do, it's hard to think of the questions right at the end. You know, you have both Ken and uh, my email address, and you can email us, and you know, we'll, we'll answer whatever we can out there. So yeah, glad to help. Um, Appreciate your time as well. So. Um, and and you know, of course, if you if if you've got any specific questions offline, you know, a lot of people don't want to come up with their specific questions. Uh, you know, in this in this forum, uh, we're glad to have a call afterwards to kind of go over some of the specific questions you might have. Even if, you know, sure. is, is this something that we want? You know, are, is this a plan that needs to be looked at, et cetera? We're we're happy to do that. But I hope it was beneficial yeah. to you. Uh, to us, we like it, but. You know, we're kind of weird, I guess. So, so th thanks for your attention, and, uh, you know, we'll look forward to being a resource to you if, uh, you know, if we can be. Enjoy the rest of the week, guys. Good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Bye.